Welcome back to Learn with Mednuggets. In today's video, we are going to talk about pulmonary embolism. Pulmonary embolism is a condition where one or more blood clots travel to the lungs and block a blood vessel. This can cause serious problems because it prevents blood from reaching parts of the lungs, which means less oxygen for the body. So how exactly does this happen? Where do these clots come from? How do these clots reach the lungs? And what exactly causes these clots? To answer these questions, let's have a look at the anatomy of blood vessels in your body. So this is your heart, these are your lungs, and this is your leg. Pulmonary embolism occurs when a clot that often starts in the legs breaks off and travels through the venous system into the inferior vena cava, right atrium, right ventricle, and then reaches the pulmonary artery where it can become lodged in one of the branches of the pulmonary artery. Depending on the site of the clot, it may block a larger vessel or a smaller peripheral artery. So a clot has blocked one of the branches of your pulmonary artery. What's the big deal? Well, the big deal is your pulmonary artery is transporting all the deoxygenated blood that your heart just received from the body. It carries this blood to the lungs to get it oxygenated and sends it back to the heart for the heart to pump it to the rest of the body and provide the necessary oxygen and nutrients for our body's every living cell. So when there's a block in the pulmonary artery, the blood supply to the area of the lung supplied by that branch is cut off. Now, if this is your alveolus and this is your artery, your breathing is fine, so your lung is getting ventilated. But since there's no blood flow, aka perfusion, there's going to be a ventilation-perfusion mismatch. The ventilation is high, but the Q or perfusion is low, leading to a high VQ ratio, which can easily be spotted in a VQ scan. But let's get to that later. This VQ mismatch creates an intrapulmonary dead space, which refers to an area where air is present but does not participate in gas exchange. This ineffective gas exchange can lead to hypoxemia. The body may try to compensate for the lack of effective gas exchange by increasing the respiratory rate and trying to take more breaths in, thinking that this might work. But unfortunately, this is not going to help at all because this is not where the problem is. So your respiratory rate will increase and soon you will be short of breath. Whenever the blood supply is cut off, the area supplied by that blood vessel may suffer from ischemia or a lack of blood supply, leading to death of these cells which we call infarction. Death is an extremely painful process, so pulmonary embolism can lead to a sharp chest pain. We call this chest pain pleuritic, which helps us to differentiate it from the chest pain you get in a myocardial infarction. The pleura are the membranes surrounding the lungs. Wherever there's ischemia and or infarction, there's going to be inflammation. So this can irritate the pleura of the lungs and when you inhale and your lungs expand and touch the pleura, it's going to elicit pain. This pain on inhalation is what we call pleuritic chest pain. The dead or infarcted tissue can bleed leading to blood in the sputum which is called hemoptysis. Hemoptysis can also happen due to increased pressure in pulmonary vessels. Whenever there's a block in a tube, pressure can build up. That's Bernoulli's principle, right? Remember, physics? So this build-up of pressure can rupture the blood vessel, resulting in bleeding. A massive blood clot can rapidly increase the pressure in the pulmonary vasculature, leading to pulmonary hypertension. This pressure can back up into your right 
ventricle and cause right ventricular strain. As a result, blood can back up to the venous system and when that happens, it can back up to the jugular vein and increase the jugular venous pressure and produce a prominent A wave. Kussmaul's sign can happen as a result. So what is Kussmaul's sign? Well, during inspiration, normally the intrathoracic pressure decreases as your thoracic cavity expands and the volume in the thoracic cavity increases. This will lead to a reduction in intrathoracic pressure as pressure and volume are inversely related. Right, Boyle's law? This decrease in pressure facilitates venous return to the heart and typically decreases the jugular venous pressure. But in a patient with right ventricular strain caused by pulmonary embolism, JVP will not decrease with inspiration due to the high-pressure system created by pulmonary hypertension. This increase in JVP with inspiration is what we call Kussmaul's sign and this can be seen in a massive pulmonary embolism. With that said, let's move back to the jugular vein. So from the jugular vein, blood can back up further into the venous system causing hepatomegaly and edema of extremities. We call this right heart failure. The massive blood clot can also significantly impair the blood flow to your heart. Less blood flow to the heart means less circulating volume. So this can lead to hypotension. When a pulmonary embolism occurs, we know that gas exchange is impaired. The resulting hypoxemia prompts the heart to beat faster in an attempt to deliver more oxygenated blood to tissues, so these patients often have sinus tachycardia, which is a common ECG finding in patients with pulmonary embolism. So to sum up, clinical features of pulmonary embolism include sharp, pleuritic chest pain, pleural rub, pleural effusion, shortness of breath, sinus tachycardia, and if it's a massive embolism, it can cause hypotension, hemoptesis, Kussmaul's sign, right ventricular heaves due to pulmonary hypertension, and gallop rhythm due to heart failure. A widely split S2 may also be heard on auscultation due to the delayed closure of the pulmonary valve caused by increased resistance in the pulmonary arteries and the impact of the right ventricular strain. So now let's have a look at the causes of pulmonary embolism. Now we know that a pulmonary embolism usually stems from a deep vein thrombus. So what causes a deep vein thrombus or deep vein thrombosis? Well, there are three factors that contribute to the formation of thrombi. We call this the virtuose triad. This includes number one, stasis of blood. When your blood is in stasis, clotting factors can accumulate and lead to the development of clots. Stasis can occur during prolonged periods of immobility like in hospitalized patients or during a long flight. It's also common in patients undergoing surgery. Number 2. Endothelial damage Endothelial damage exposes underlying tissue and collagen, promoting platelet activation and the clotting cascade leading to thrombus formation. This can happen in trauma, inflammatory conditions or certain medical conditions like diabetes, hypertension and cancer. Number 3. Hypercoagulability Hypercoagulable states can enhance the likelihood of thrombus formation even in the presence of normal blood flow. For example, genetic conditions like factor V laden mutation, protein C and S deficiency, medical conditions like cancer, autoimmune disorders, and hormonal factors like pregnancy, birth control pills, and chronic conditions like diabetes, hypertension, etc. can lead to a hypercoagulable state. So how do you diagnose a pulmonary embolism? 
since a pulmonary embolism presents with chest pain, you must do an ECG to rule out a myocardial infarction. The ECG will show sinus tachycardia consistent with a pulmonary embolism. However, a massive pulmonary embolism can present with the S1, Q3, T3 sign. The chest X-ray is usually normal in pulmonary embolism as pulmonary embolism is usually associated with linear atelectasis and small pleural effusions. We always do a D-dimer test to rule out a pulmonary embolism. This is just a screening test. It's not a confirmatory test. That's a very important point to remember. The gold standard test is a CT pulmonary angiogram where you inject dye to visualize blood vessels. And this will show you if there's a clot present or not. But in patients where CTPA is contraindicated, like in patients with renal insufficiency or patients with contrast allergies, we can do a VQ scan to diagnose pulmonary embolism. There's also a clinical scoring system called the Wells criteria that is used to estimate the probability of a pulmonary embolism and to help guide further diagnostic testing and management. With that said, now let's move on to the treatment of pulmonary embolism. Management includes high flow oxygen, intravenous fluids, inotropes, and anticoagulation. You can anticoagulate with IV unfractionated heparin in the hospital setting. Low molecular weight heparin like enoxaparin and daltaparin are commonly used for outpatient treatment. Direct oral anticoagulants such as rivaroxaban, apixaban and edoxaban can be used for initial and long-term treatment. Thrombolytics such as altiplase and tenecteplase can also be used to dissolve the clot rapidly, especially in life-threatening cases. Thrombolytics are usually preserved for massive pulmonary embolism with hemodynamic instability or in patients with severe respiratory distress. Mechanical interventions such as IVC filters can be considered in patients with recurrent pulmonary emboli despite anticoagulation or in patients who cannot receive anticoagulation due to bleeding risks. The point of this filter is to catch the clots before they reach the lungs. So that brings us to the end of today's video. Thanks for watching and have a great day.